Kia ora team, my name's Ben and today we are going to go through spinal shock, neurogenic shock and autonomic dysreflexia, also known as autonomic hyperreflexia. Okay, first of all, let's talk about our autonomic nervous system. This gorgeous picture I've drawn here, we've got our brain, brain stem and our spinal cord broken into our cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral. Now, our autonomic nervous system is a part of our nervous system that works without us thinking about it. So it's automatic. And we've got two branches, our sympathetic, which is our fight, flight, fright, and our parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest. So it's important to know our parasympathetic has craniosacral outflow. So it comes out of our brainstem via our cranial nerves, um, in particular vagus, our 10th one, we'll talk about that soon, and also down through our sacrum, we've got some parasympathetic outflow, craniosacral. Whereas our sympathetic nervous system, its outflow comes via our sympathetic chain, which is a row of ganglion that is from T1 down to L2 or L3. So our vagus nerve, it's called the wanderer, a vagrant wanderer. So it goes to our heart, but it also wanders throughout most of our body, giving our, our parasympathetic flow. And the sacral portion, it comes out and does the lower stuff. All right, with our sympathetic chain, our sympathetic outflow, from T1 to T5, that does our head, neck, heart, and our upper limbs. Then from T6 to T12, that's our abdominal organs. And then below that, we get our pelvic organs, renal and lower limbs. Okay, why is this important? So, if we have a spinal cord injury, wherever that injury is, below that, we're going to knock out all the function in the short term. And that's called spinal shock. So spinal shock is a loss of function below the injury and this is our motor control, sensory, reflexes, and autonomic nervous system. And some of this can be temporary. So spinal shock lasts up to about six weeks, generally. After about six weeks, we may start getting our autonomic function back and some reflex function back. Now, where this is important is if we get a high spinal cord injury, so T6 is our magic number. If we get a spinal cord injury at or above T6, we're at risk of developing neurogenic shock. So spinal shock is just a loss of function below, and part of that's temporary for up to six weeks. If we lose our autonomic control below T6 up, then we're knocking out most of our sympathetic nervous system. And what our sympathetic nervous system does is generally we can think of a sympathetic squeeze. Most of our blood vessels are only innervated by our sympathetic nervous system and are told to squeeze. This is important because when they squeeze, it increases total peripheral resistance and therefore increases our blood pressure. If we get rid of our sympathetic flow, then we're going to vasodilate. So therefore our blood pressure will decrease because of less resistance. So now, if we have spinal shock and we have an injury at T6 or above, then we've got all of this abdominal organs and everything below, which now aren't going to have that sympathetic control, so we're going to get vasodilation. If we have a lot of vasodilation, then we're going to run into problems with neurogenic shock. The definition of neurogenic shock is a decrease in sympathetic tone and or an increase in parasympathetic tone. So what's happening here is that we've got our spinal injury above T6. With all that vasodilation that's happening below because of loss of sympathetic control, we're decreasing blood pressure. And the higher up we go, remember our heart was innervated by T1 to T5. So the higher up we go, now we're losing that sympathetic control of our heart. Sympathetic nervous system, if we're gonna fight a tiger, we wanna increase the heart rate. Parasympathetic, rest and digest, we wanna slow the heart rate. So the higher up we have that injury, 
the more we start knocking out our sympathetic control of the heart. So now we're going to lose that ability to increase our heart rate. So our heart rate drops as well as the vasodilation below. So now we've got neurogenic shock. Bradycardia, slow heart rate, hypotension because of our vasodilation and slow heart rate. Okay, so this spinal shock and neurogenic shock, if it's caused by a spinal cord injury, it's going to be in the acute phase because remember spinal shock lasts up to six weeks. So if we're going to get neurogenic shock because of a spinal cord injury, we're going to have to have that spinal shock to knock out everything below. Once the spinal shock has resolved, and now we're six weeks post or a year post, so chronic, um, our autonomic function can return and our spinal reflexes can return, but we're still not going to be able to get messages up past the injury site if it's a complete injury to the brain. So we may still not get motor and sensory function back. So now, chronically, long term, we can get a thing called autonomic dysreflexia. So for this to happen, which is an exaggerated sympathetic response to a noxious stimuli, we have to have had our spinal cord injury at or above T6, because remember, that's where we knock out a lot of the sympathetic control. So to get autonomic dysreflexia, you have to have a spinal injury at or above T6. Okay, what is this? What's going to happen? So if we get a noxious stimuli below the injury, and I'll, I'll put a big list of them here, but you can broadly think of it as like three Bs. Bladder problem, bowel problem, or a skin breakdown. If this happens below the site of injury, then we're going to get a sensation coming into the spinal cord. So sensory receptors send afferent message to spinal cord. That still works, but the message can't go beyond the injury site to the brain. So if we've got a, a full bladder, which is now, because of a blocked catheter, which is now causing pain, the message goes into the spinal cord, comes up, gets to the injury site, and now can't go to the brain. So this person won't feel the pain because we only feel pain once it gets to our brain. But they'll perceive it through their receptors and their nerves. It'll go into the spinal cord and it'll stimulate that autonomic response. And pain will stimulate our sympathetic nervous system because pain is all to do with fight, flight, fright. If we're feeling pain, you fight the tiger or you run away from the tiger. So our noxious stimuli will stimulate our sympathetic response and our sympathetic response causes that sympathetic squeeze. So it squeezes the blood vessels to increase blood pressure so we can help us fight the tiger. The problem is with all this vasoconstriction below the injury level, we do exactly that. We get increased blood pressure because we increase our total peripheral resistance. Remember our blood pressure equation? Blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. So now, in our spinal cord, we've got the message coming in, and it has a reflex, uh, sympathetic response. So everything below here is vasoconstricting, getting ready to fight a tiger because of pain. But, remember, we can't send that message up to the brain. So normally, we would get the message, there's pain, and your body would do something to sort it out. Because this person doesn't feel that pain below the site of injury, so therefore, they don't do anything about it. So we've got this response with continued vasoconstriction, so blood pressure just keeps on going skyrocket high. Okay. Our body will sense that increased blood pressure, and this is our um, baroreceptor response. So remember, in the arch of the aorta, in our carotid sinuses, we got baroreceptors, which sense stretch. So they're going to sense, oh my goodness, our blood pressure is shooting through the roof, and they're going to try to fix it. 
So baroreceptors in our aortic arch and carotid sinuses detect our increased blood pressure. Then our parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, via our vagus nerve, told you this would come back, sends a message to our heart to say, calm the farm, slow down. So our heart rate will decrease, because remember, if we decrease our heart rate, we decrease our cardiac output to try to decrease blood pressure. So this is a good thing. The other way our baroreceptor response tries to decrease blood pressure is fix the problem. We're all vasoconstricted because of a pain response. So it says um, we inhibit the sympathetic outflow coming from our brainstem going downwards to get passive vasodilation above our injury level. So now we vasodilate above the injury level. We'd love to keep sending that message down to vasodilate below, but remember that spinal cord injury means that message can't get through. The other thing our brainstem does by inhibiting the sympathetic outflow, it stops the vasoconstriction above, so passively we vasodilate without the sympathetic message, and it also decrease, decreases our heart rate and the heart contract contractility. Because again, our sympathetic message is to increase heart rate, so we remove that. The message to decrease our sympathetic outflow can't reach below the injury, so therefore we get continued vasoconstriction below with vasodilation above, and our vagus nerve telling our heart rate to slow down. But unfortunately, because if the injury is so high, then we've got so much vasoconstriction in our body, therefore those measures won't work and we may decrease the heart rate and get some bradycardia, but with so much vasoconstriction, the blood pressure still goes through the roof. All right, so what symptoms do we get? Uh, a severe headache with autonomic dysreflexia, because you imagine blood pressure's skyrocketing, so all that pressure in the head. We get flushing and sweating above. So remember, above the injury, we've got vasodilation, so we're gonna go red. And with that vasodilation to the skin, the local area around the skin is gonna get warm. So that'll stimulate a sweating response to try to cool that area. So that's why we're gonna be flushed and sweaty above the level of injury and then cool and pale below. So remember below, we've got the sympathetic response that's causing vasoconstriction. So when we vasoconstrict, less blood flowing to the skin, we're gonna get cool and pale. Uh, nasal, nasal congestion, blurred vision. So nasal congestion, parasympathetic response above and blurred vision because so much blood pressure, it's putting pressure on the blood vessels in our eyes. And then if we don't control these symptoms or sort out the noxious stimuli to remove this, then we can go, the complications could be a stroke and seizures due to extreme high blood pressure, myocardial infarction, again, heart attack, extreme blood pressure, pulmonary edema, retinal hemorrhage, or death. So with our autonomic dysreflexia, we can give vasodilation drugs, but of course they're only going to be a short-term temporary help because if you still have a noxious stimuli, we're still going to get that feedback coming out telling our blood vessels to vasoconstrict. So the main thing we need to find is what is the noxious stimuli that's causing the problem. Okay, quick recap. Spinal shock is after a spinal cord injury, we get a loss of function below that level. So everything goes. Motor, sensory, reflex, autonomic. And this is short term and it can last up to six weeks. And then our spinal shock will resolve and we may get a return of reflexes and autonomic function. And depending on the degree of and how complete the injury is, is whether motor or sensory, some can come back. If it's complete, then we won't get any. 
then if we have spinal shock, we can also get neurogenic shock. So neurogenic shock, that is a form of circulatory shock and a form of distributive shock because we get massive vasodilation. With neurogenic shock, it happens if we have a spinal injury above T6 because then we lose a lot of sympathetic control below. And if we knock out our sympathetic control, we only have, or we've got mostly, our parasympathetic control. And our parasympathetic nervous system causes bradycardia, or decreased heart rate. And if we can't have our sympathetic nervous system causing vasoconstriction, our blood vessels will dilate. So with decreased heart rate and vasodilation, we now get distributive shock and neurogenic shock. Decreased sympathetic tone and increased parasympathetic function, bradycardia, hypotension, boom. Okay, so for neurogenic shock to happen, we need to have spinal shock at the same time. Once we've gone past that six weeks or so, then spinal shock goes away and chronically, people can get autonomic dysreflexia. So again, it has to be a spinal cord injury at T6 or above. And this one, it's been ages, it could be a year later, and there's a noxious stimuli that they don't feel because they don't, the message doesn't get sent to the brain, but that noxious stimuli comes in, we get a sympathetic response, so lots of vasoconstriction, if we get lots of vasoconstriction, blood pressure shoots up. Our body senses increased blood pressure. We get our baroreceptor response, and it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system above the level of injury. So our vagus nerve will decrease our heart rate, and our brainstem will decrease our sympathetic outflow. And so above, we get vasodilation because of decreased sympathetic outflow. But that message to switch off our sympathetic nervous system can't get past our injury level. So below the injury, we still get vasoconstriction. So we're going to get super high blood pressure. All right, team, there we go. Spinal shock, neurogenic shock, autonomic dysreflexia, done. Happy studying. <laughs>